In the early 1940s, the U.S. government authorized a top-secret program of nuclear testing and development, codenamed the Manhattan Project. Its goal was the development of the world's first atomic bomb. Much of the research and development for the project occurred at a facility built in Los Alamos, New Mexico. In July of 1945, Los Alamos scientists successfully exploded the first atomic bomb at the Trinity Test Site, located in nearby Alamogordo. They would go on to be used on Hiroshima and Nagasaki to bring an end to World War II. So much time, money, and resources were spent in creating the atomic bomb. But at the end of the war, when the power of the atom became known to all, a question was posed. Now what? In a time of war, the nuclear bomb had become the end-all solution to conflict. Its devastating power had the ability to completely vaporize anything unfortunate enough to be near it, and the fallout that remained after made sure even the structures that remained in the area would not be safe to return to for some time. But after World War II, as peace was coming as a relief to those trying to rebuild what they lost in the war, the US wanted to ask, how can the unrivaled power of the atom be used for good? How can it be used to create instead of destroy? And most importantly, how can we use this as an excuse to continue building our nuclear arsenal in the event of future conflicts? This will be the first video in a series, detailing the different aspects of the era of the peaceful nuclear explosion, also known as non-military atomic research. During this series, we will be covering everything from the use of nukes for excavation, to fracking, space exploration, farming, and more. So if you would like to learn something new about the United States' history of peaceful nuclear explosions, stick around, and don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss out on the rest of the series. Our story begins on December 8th of 1953. President Dwight D. Eisenhower delivered his Adams for Peace speech to the UN General Assembly. It came as so many people had witnessed the horrors of the atom bomb in Japan, and feared it may one day be dropped on their city. The speech was made to help balance the fears of nuclear armament with the promises of peaceful use of uranium in the future. He wanted to let the people of the world know that the U.S. was not intent on pursuing war, but a collaborative agreement in which countries used nukes to help each other. He said in his speech, It is with the book of history and not with isolated pages that the United States will ever wish to be identified. My country wants to be constructive, not destructive. It wants agreement, not wars among nations. It wants itself to live in freedom, and in the confidence that the people of every other nation enjoy equally the right of choosing their own way of life. To the making of these fateful decisions, the United States pledges before you, and therefore before the world, its determination to help solve the fearful atomic dilemma, to devote its entire heart and mind, to find the way by which the miraculous inventiveness of man shall not be dedicated to his death, but consecrated to his life. Prior to this speech, atomic development had been of the utmost secrecy both from other nations and also from the American public. Now the development of nukes were coming into the public eye, and Eisenhower was calling for the public to now support the U.S. as they tested nukes in an effort to advance the nations in ways they hadn't even dreamed of. Yet, even Eisenhower knew the risks a nuclear world introduced. Approving a National Security Council report that stated only a massive atomic weapons base would deter violence from the Soviet Union. This belief that to avoid a nuclear war, the United States must stay on the offensive, ready to strike at any time, is the same reason that the Soviet Union would not give up its atomic weapons either, leading to the rise of the Cold War. But where to start the future of the Atoms for Peace movement? Well, there were a few ideas. Soon after Eisenhower's speech, Operation Plowshare began. This was the name for the U.S. program for the development of techniques to use nuclear explosives for peaceful purposes. The first proposal for the project that actually came close to being carried out was Project Chariot. It would have used several hydrogen bombs to create an artificial harbor at Cape Thompson, Alaska. It was thought that burying several nuclear bombs deep in the ground and then detonating them could be a far more cost-effective way to clear land for massive projects and the harbor at Cape Thompson would be massive, planned at its largest size to be about the size of Delaware. Yet, there was a problem. Many of the natives to that area were understandably concerned about the lingering radiation that might affect the inhabitants and the nature of the surrounding area, but someone stepped up to try and soothe their concerns. Hungarian-born American theoretical physicist Edward Teller was a key player in Project Plowshare. 
He was known as one of the fathers of the hydrogen bomb after successfully encouraging the U.S. government to develop the program in the 50s, and he was also a huge proponent of peaceful nuclear explosions. Writing into Popular Mechanics back in March of 1960, his article was borderline narcissistically titled, We Are Going to Work Miracles. It advocated for the creation of the harbor at Cape Thompson. He would describe it as an experiment of great hope for the future, stating that such a crater can appear in the matter of milliseconds by the explosion of just five nuclear bombs, having approximately as much power as 500,000 tons of TNT. When later questioned about the radiation concerns, he optimistically suggested that much of the radiation would be buried deep underground, and that it would be possible within two weeks for people to work safely above the site of the explosion. This wasn't really based on much of anything, and eventually public opinion became that of strong opposition to the project. The government listened and as a great victory for the local Inupit Eskimos and other citizens of the surrounding area, they cancelled the project. But they would not be discouraged. Another scheme that came extremely close to reality was the Pan-Atomic Canal. The original Panama Canal had been determined in the 50s and 60s to not quite be enough to handle the demand. Their solution was to make another one. The Pan-Atomic Canal, which would provide both militaristic and trade support to the US and its allies, was a decidedly serious proposal. After all, American ingenuity had achieved an unparalleled engineering feat in the region half a century earlier. So why not double down on what the nation was clearly already quite good at? So, in the early to mid-1960s, plans were drawn up to create a nuclear forge sequel to the Panama Canal. The Interoceanic Sea Level Canal Study, as it was technically referred to, was in fact a third-generation scheme, with the first two cropping up before being nixed in 1939 and 1946 respectively. The former was designed to just increase capacity, whereas the latter was aimed to provide a backup in case the original was attacked with, funnily enough, nuclear weapons. The cost, according to a series of 1964 congressional hearings, would be anything between $620 million, if nukes were used, to $13 billion if they weren't. The economics of the situation seemed promising, so in 1967 to 1968, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineering sent 50 geologists to look for the best possible routes through Central America. Paths through Nicaragua, Panama, and Colombia were identified. The best of these would still require as much as 1.53 billion cubic meters of material to be blasted out of the way. That's roughly equivalent to throwing 592 Great Pyramids of Giza into the air in all directions, so clearly you need a fair amount of explosives. The project began to precipitate back in early 1957. Back then there was a large margin of error on the specifics, with as little as 26 to as many as 764 nukes being proposed to complete the project. As time went on, it was agreed that the U.S. would use multiple 2, 5, and 15 megaton nuclear weapons, the last of which is 1,000 times more powerful than the bomb dropped on Hiroshima, to progressively dig out the canal. So-called buggy tests were carried out in Nevada, using multiple low-yield nuclear weapons buried beneath ground level several hundred meters apart to create a ditch. At the same time, larger nukes shot nearby were used to provide a scalable comparison. All of these may have seemed fine in the isolation of the desert, but it was a different story when it came to putting it into practice. By 1969, the atmosphere had changed somewhat. Several test shots designed to round off the canal digging studies were canceled citing concerns over radiation release. A 1970 report spearheaded by the respected Corps of Engineers Brigadier General Charles Noble advised against the plan, noting that it would not be economically viable and would endanger both the environment and various indigenous populations. Although we are confident that someday nuclear explosions will be used in a wide variety of massive earth-moving projects, no current decision on U.S. canal policy should be made in the expectation that nuclear excavation technology will be available for canal construction, the report concluded. The Panama Canal itself didn't get a twin in the end, but it was ultimately widened over the last decade, all without the aid of any nuclear explosions. There were other projects that involved moving literal mountains worth of Earth as well, such as Project Carryall, that proposed having 22 nukes blow up the mountains in California's Mojave Desert so that a new highway and railroad could be built, there was also the proposal to use 520 nukes to blast a second Suez Canal through Israel's Negev Desert. 
While many of the projects proposed weren't followed through, it showed the U.S.'s willingness to use nukes for the creation of mega-infrastructure projects. Yet these brute force designs were just the beginning of the imaginative projects the U.S. would try to make a reality. Over the course of two decades, the U.S. would dabble in many fields, testing not only with the power of the explosion, but also with the delicate nature of the effects of radiation. As much as I would love to go into the other projects right now, I can typically only research, script, record, and edit one 10-minute video per week. That's why I've decided to make this into a short series where I go through all of the proposed plans for atomic devices, separating each video by category of use. This week's was focused on the excavation projects, but the next one will dive into a topic that I've personally been fascinated by. Nuclear bombs in space. So if that sounds interesting to you, don't forget to blow up the subscribe button, and thank you for watching. As always, see you next time.